Okay, so we are going to start to learn how to interpret um, periodontal disease on radiographs. This is some more fun topic, I think. Um, here are our objectives. List and explain limitations of using radiographs for diagnosis of periodontal disease. List and explain benefits of radiographs in diagnosis of periodontal disease. Describe the difference between horizontal and vertical bone loss. Explain the distribution of periodontal disease. Compare and contrast the severity of periodontal disease. Compare and contrast healthy periodontium with disease. And identify calculus on radiographs as well as other factors contributing to periodontal disease. Okay. So what are the limitations of taking a radiograph in regards to periodontal disease? Well, a radiograph is a 2D image of a 3D structure. So that means that there is going to be things that we are not going to be able to see because everything has been flattened down to just two planes. So um, there are going to be aspects of root morphology and root and the uh, morphology of the bone that um, we're not going to be able to see those dips and, and um, areas of maybe lower bone in certain areas. It's just going to all look kind of flat. We might see just those highest points. Um, it's not going to show whether the disease is active. We could be looking at almost like what we might call a scar of periodontal disease, um, destruction that happened when the disease was active but it's just stabilized and you know the bone hasn't grown back so we're we're almost looking at the equivalency of a scar um, never substitute it's never a substitute for clinical periodontal assessment so you can't just take a radiograph and diagnose periodontal disease you absolutely use it in tandem with your full periodontal assessment that you do with your um, patients. So they really are absolutely necessary and better together. Does not show early bone loss or early frication involvement. So it really is dependent on the angle that you um, direct the beam um, if you are lucky enough to catch a little bit of something. But usually you um, cannot see the destruction of the bone or the frication involvement until it's actually um, gone um, quite a bit of a ways into the bone, especially for a frication, because a lot of times this the the morphology of the root can block that um, little area that would be radiolucent. Does not show tooth mobility, so you can sort of guess that something may be mobile, but you're not going to be able to tell that unless you actually get in there with um, two blunt end instruments and do a mobility test, or if it's really mobile, you can just wiggle it with your finger. So what are the benefits of a radiograph? So radiograph does show bony changes though. You can compare one radiograph to another and see how the bone um, has changed over time, especially if you take it with the same, like if the same person takes it with the same instruments and the same angle and they're really consistent or if a team is really calibrated and they and they just take really great x-rays and things are really consistent, then you it's really a wonderful tool for kind of documenting the change over time. Um, you can see some tooth and root morphology, which is nice. Um, so you can't, some things you can't see, but you can see other things. So it, it can be helpful. Um, you can start to see a widening of the PDL. Um, you can see frication involvement, which is really nice because um, once it gets to a point where you can actually see it, you know, normally all you can ever do is feel a frication. Um, so it's really nice to be able to actually kind of have some kind of a visual on a radiograph. You're able to see abscesses. You could see um, you know, the either periodontal abscess or um, an apical abscess, a, um, an endodontic abscess. You can see uh, localized factors such as overhanging restorations or calculus or um, an ill-fitting um, or cement, extra cement that's squished out after a crown was placed, you know, so a um, number of things like that or um, little fragments of filling material or, you know, whatever it might be. 
And then you can see other types of pathology like cysts or something in the bone and different things like that. Periodontal examination is incomplete without accurate radiographs. Yes, that's true. Okay, so what type of radiograph is best to view bone loss? So here we have a couple different examples. This um, one up here is an example of taking a PA with a paralleling technique. Um, and then this is an example of taking a PA with a bisecting technique. And one thing you can start to notice here is that when you use the paralleling technique, you can see you're coming in much straighter. The long axis of the tooth is um, parallel with the film, and then the, the um, central ray is coming in perpendicular, and those angles are much more conducive for actually visualizing the height of bone. And then down here, you can see, because of that distortion that we get with bisecting, everything is kind of flopped over and slanted, and you get a very poor image of the actual um, bone height. Everything just kind of looks almost like it got pushed over to the side or something. So we much prefer a paralleling technique to get accurate, um, to get accurate uh, bone heights. And then, oh, and then here we have a horizontal bite wing, and then we have a vertical bite wing. And you can see that with perio, it is much, much more important that we um, use vertical bite wings because we can see far more of the bone than when we use a horizontal. So any time in, when you're in clinic and you have a periodontal patient, unless they are very, very mild and they're due for bite wings, ask yourself, should I be taking vertical bite wings? And the answer is probably yes. Oops, I went, got a little excited there. Radiographic interpretation. So a um, couple things that we have to know about. So periodontal disease, what is that? Um, peri is um, the root word peri means around the tooth. Um, it's a group of diseases that affect the tissues around the teeth. Um, CEJ, you need to know what, what the CEJ is and what you're looking at on a radiograph because that's we'll use that as kind of a um, uh, like a place where we measure from um, for the bone height. So that is the um, cemento enamel junction. So it's about where the there's usually a little bit of a space between where the cementum start starts and the enamel stops, or it can be a little bit overlapped. You guys are probably learning this, but basically once we um, run down to the end of the enamel, we call that the CEJ. Um, let's see, the junction between the crown and the root. Um, and then there's the alveolar crest. That is the, oh, let me get my little pointer. Um, so the CEJ is right here at the junction where the enamel ends and then the cementum begins. Here, 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 here. And then the alveolar crest is the very top of the bone in between each tooth. So bone visible in between the teeth on the radiograph. So in health, when somebody has a healthy periodontium, the alveolar crest should be about 1.5 to 2 millimeters just below the CEJ. Really very close. Um, the shape of it should be, if it's in the anteriors, it should be pretty sharp and um, kind of pointy and it should be pretty radiopaque because it's there's not a lot of space between the mandibular anterior so it should be pretty radiopaque and then in the posterior it kind of flattens off off a little bit or it's a maybe a little bit rounded it kind of depends um, it should be pretty smooth. It's generally fairly parallel to the lines between the CEJ. So this can be a little bit tricky because if teeth are, um, if teeth are at different levels, if they're not all perfectly kind of level and their CEJs are slightly different, it might 
fool some people, the untrained eye, and they might think they're looking at vertical bone loss because the, the alveolar crest can look kind of vertically slanted. But if you compare the CEJs, you may see that one C CEJ is higher than the other, and the bone basically just follows that pattern. In the posterior, it's also less opaque because it's kind of a wider swath of bone in between the molars and the premolars, and so there is um, a little bit more of shades of gray in the posterior. All right. So the lamina dura, that is a very radiopaque line that surrounds the root. You can kind of see it all the way around here and here. So just keep your eye out for that. Notice that when you're looking at radiographs, if you can see the lamina dura. Periodontal ligament is this radiolucent area just between the root and the lamina dura. It's the periodontal ligament, or the PDL. Radiolucent line between the lamina dura and the root, continuous and uniform. So um, when we evaluate the periodontium, um, the location and the condition of the alveolar crest, we want to look at that. These are, the, these are the things we want to pay attention to. We want to look at the lamina dura and the periodontal ligament space. We want to see, is the lamina dura visible? And is the periodontal ligament space look pretty narrow and smooth, or is it kind of widened in some areas? We want to look at local factors affecting the periodontium, so we want to notice all the restorations. Do any of them have um, like overhanging margins or rough edges? We want to notice sites of food impaction between open contact teeth. Is there like a space between premolars or molars that is wide in packing food? We want to notice the presence of calculus between teeth. Um, and we'll look at what that looks like later. And then we want to look for occlusal trauma. Does it look like they're clenching, grinding, um, wearing, you know, their teeth with like toothbrush abrasion or something like that? And we'll show that later too. So here's some images of uh, a healthy periodontium, although I have to say this looks a little bit more than two millimeters to me that looks like. But that could be, um, sometimes people do have some, they have healthy periodontiums, but they might have a little bone loss because they had braces or something, some other factor affected um, their periodontium, not necessarily um, periodontal disease specifically. Um, so who knows, maybe something like that. But you can see there's a good um, uh, lamina dura there. There's very tight um, periodontal ligament space, so this just might be their their normal because everybody is you know a little bit different. There, this here looks much obviously much shorter, closer. The bone is a lot closer to the CEJ um, over here than here, but it might just be the difference in the individual. Now you can see the vast difference between a pair a diseased periodontium. I mean, the bone level is just like fallen. You can see the bone level starts way down here. The CEJ is way up here. Um, we can see this is a image of the furcation involvement. So the furcation is that space between the roots. So we have um, one furcation on the mandibular molars and then up in the uh, maxilla we have a couple different ways to come in and, and get um, into the furcations because there's three roots up there. Um, you can also see this bumpy um, look on the sides of the roots here. This is all calculus. So there you can see that a lot of times when you're looking at a diseased periodontium, you're looking at a very low bone level, you're looking at furcation involvement, a widened PDL. I don't see a huge great image of a widened PDL. I guess some of them look a little wide, but, um, and then all, oftentimes you'll see calculus. So um, here are some more examples of calculus. You can see this huge spur of calculus off the side of this uh, molar here, and you can see another spur here, and then 
in through here. And then these anterior teeth are just absolutely ring. We call it rings of calculus. You can see that it's all like this more radiopacity on the front of the, well, this is probably the, actually like the lingual surface, but you can see that it's, it's absolutely surrounding and then it's coming off the edges on the mesial and distal. So there's rings of calculus around all these anterior teeth. So um, faulty overhanging restorations is the other um, thing that kind of irritant that can be, you know, uh, progressing or causing the further destruction of the periodontium due to harboring bacteria and causing all sorts of problems. So down in here, you can see instead of it being a nice, smooth, oh my gosh, I'm pointing the whole time, you guys, I was pointing to a different screen. I'm just going to back up real quick. So these are... This is the um, big spur of calculus here. This is big spur of calculus here. These are like the rings of calculus. You can see it's kind of more radiopaque right through here and here. And then you can see these little blops coming off the side, these, these little bulbs of calculus. What was the one before? Oh, there was, yeah, all this calculus. That's calculus and this and this and this and this and this. And even anytime you just see kind of even a lumpy root, even if it's not a spur, you know that's calculus. Okay, so now we're looking at these um, restorations here. And a, re um, a restoration should have a nice smooth margin that comes down like this. But here we have these big old overhangs. And that is just going to collect everything under the sun. Food and plaque and calculus. And it's just going to cause a horrible environment. Very hard to clean clean, very hard to keep healthy. Um, recurrent decay is another problem because of the harboring bacteria, so that is no good. Oh, I think it said calculus too. So yeah, you can see a little bit of calculus here, you can see some calculus, oh my gosh, you can see calculus here, you can see calculus here. And then what about calculus on this one? Do you guys see any calculus there? You can see it's all kind of lumpy right through here and here and here. It's all over the place. What about this one? You see any calculus? You got calc a spur here. You got a sp some here. You got some here. You got some here. You start to see that it's not as radiopaque as the tooth or the root. Um, but it is fairly radiopaque, and sometimes there can be a fairly good-sized piece of calculus, but it doesn't pick up on the radiograph, so you can't always see calculus on the radiographs, but you can quite often. Calculus, local factors, decay. This image has, like, a little bit of everything. You see a big old cavity here. You can see spurs of calculus up in here. This is a pretty blurry image, but you can see all these spurs of calculus overhang restorations. I mean, this is just a mess, really. Okay. So, one thing that's going to be hard for you guys because you're using an older textbook for radio um, radiology is that in 2017 or 2018, I can't remember, um, the American Academy of Periodontology changed the way they classify periodontal disease. It used to be that they classified it with a system that was like mild, moderate, severe, class one. It was like a class system, class one, class two, class three. And, um, and then they went to this staging classification, which is far more in line with the way medicine classifies disease. So when we look at this new staging system, um, there are some things that have stayed similar uh, or the same, and there are things that have changed. So some things that we still use are when we talk about how much disease is um is present. So we talk about in terms of localized or generalized. So um, it's fairly straightforward. We just basically say if it's localized, then there should be at or 
less than 30% of sites in the mouth. So if they have 30 teeth, then no more than 10 teeth um, should have um, should have any kind of evidence of periodontal disease. That would be localized. Um, generalized would be uh, greater than 30% of sites. So if they had, let's say they had all their wisdom teeth taken out and they had 28 teeth in their mouth, they could not have any more than eight teeth um, with some kind of periodontal involvement um, or else they would be termed generalized. So if they if they had eight, 28 teeth and they had seven teeth with some kind of periodontal, you know, bone loss, and then you could call it localized. If it was more than eight teeth, you'd have to call it generalized. Um, and then we talk about uh, the pattern of bone loss. So this is the extent, this is sort of the extent of the disease, and then we talk about the pattern. So the pattern of bone loss, bone loss can either happen in um, horizontal, just kind of keeps going straight down, like both sides stay pretty even on either side, and that's usually visible in um, stage one and two. And then there's vertical bone loss, which is it um, maybe one side loses bone a lot faster than the other, um, or you get these bony defects that just do this big vertical um, dip down into like say a furcation or something like that. That's usually um, when we're looking at a more advanced stage of stage three or four. Furcation involvement automatically knocks you up to stage three or four. And then moderate or severe ridge defect. So if there's some major defect happening with the bony ridge the, in um, all together, then that automatically brings it to a stage three or four. So when if we look at these stages a little bit closely, uh, we can compare it. We sort of can still sometimes talk about it in these slight slash mild, moderate, severe kind of terms, but we're, um, because some, some people don't even use this, like not everybody in dentistry has um, transitioned. Uh, we're teaching, we started with, I think the class, it was either the last graduating class or the class before that we started with the staging. Um, and so this is fairly new to us as well, but some, uh, so when you, even when you guys graduate a year, you know, year and a half from now and you go out, you may work at an office that does not, is not understanding the staging as well as you will understand it. And, uh, you may have to kind of help train hygienists maybe that are older that haven't really used the staging and they're more accustomed to them, just mild, moderate, severe. Um, so when we look at stage one, the criteria basically is that the coronal third of the bone, um, you can't have more than 15% of the coronal third of the bone um, have been lost. And that's a very small amount. You will show some examples in the radiographs, but that's a pretty small amount. So just a very slight amount of bone loss. And that's why it used to be called slight because it really is not very much. Um, stage two is somewhere between up to a third, basically. You can kind of generalize it and say basically the, the first coronal third of bone. So the, the, the part of the bone that's closest to the crown of the tooth is what the coronal third means. And basically you can have about a third of that bone um, have um, been lost and you can still be in what's called a stage two or what some people call moderate um, periodontal disease or moderate bone loss. Stage three um, is when we start to get, um, go into the severe stage and it can't, there can't be any more than there's either four or less missing teeth from specifically periodontal um, disease. So not like they knocked out a tooth playing basketball. It has to be a tooth that was lost because of periodontal disease. So no more than four teeth missing. And then it can, the bone loss um, will be extending to the middle third of the root and beyond. So it's more than a third of the way, basically. It's more like, um, you know, halfway almost. 
Um, so more than 33% basically and extending to the middle third. So that's stage three. And then stage four is um, more than five, more than five um, missing teeth from periodontal disease. Five or more, I should say. Five or more. And then the bone um, is also extending to the middle third of the root and beyond. Um, so those two, and it'll make a little bit more sense here when we start looking at some pictures. It's very hard to just describe it without seeing it. Oh, extent, severity, complexity. Okay, there's those words. All right, so here are some images. So now we can start to actually see a little bit more of what we're talking about. So horizontal bone loss basically follows the um, the the level of say where the you know the CEJ is. So here we have the CEJ in this top line here, and then here we have the bone loss has just kind of just dropped like straight down, just like fell. And we can start to see some frication involvement as well. See how it's starting to get radial loosen in between the roots there and here as well. Um, but it's just straight across. The bone has just dropped straight across. Vertical bone loss, on the other hand, um, is goes, you can see how it's like a slope. So one side, on one side of the tooth, it has stayed up a little higher, and on the other side, on the adjacent tooth, it's just gone whoop and just gone straight down. So it's, the bone is not um, being destroyed evenly on both sides. Something is happening over here that is causing the bone to degrade much faster. What that is, is hard to say, um, but if something is happening. It might have something to do with their, um, parafunction or their occlusion or the specific quality of that site that, you know, something about just the the biology of the bacteria at that site. I mean, it's who knows, but something is making it um, degrade much faster. And you can see it the same thing here. And then you can start to see some frication involvement there. Um, and this is kind of what that vertical bone loss looks like. There might be um, still some of a height of the alveolar bone, but it's degrading all, and this is what's causing that widening of the PDL. You can see that like right through here pretty clearly. See, and, or like even better right through here. See how you can really see how the PDL is widened and that bone is just degrading. So that's what's happening in that vertical bone loss. Complexity. There's a, what is the yellow arrow pointing to? Oh, well, it's highlighting the vertical bone loss there. Okay. All right, so um, it's a little bit more about extent and pattern. So horizontal bone loss, um, the alveolar crest, um, less, you know, about two millimeters or less from the CEJ. That's what we want to see. Lamina dura usually lost the well-defined radiopaque edge. So in disease, we usually start to lose that lamina dura. You can see that it's just not really um, apparent so much. I mean, you can kind of see maybe a smidge of something here, but it's just not really apparent anymore. Um, we've lost that well-defined radiopaque edge. Hard to determine whether disease is active or stable from the radiographs. We said that already. We don't know if this is old bone loss that happened a decade ago and they've been stable ever since or if they're actively losing bone. Vertical bone loss greater degree of bone loss on the interproximal aspect of one tooth compared to the adjacent tooth may require surgical treatment to try and regenerate bone. Now, when I was working in a perio office, one thing I heard the um, periodontists say to patients all the time was that there needed they could do a bone graft, but there needed to be a a framework to build bone into. So, if there was a vertical bone um, defect, a vertical bony defect, he could actually, I worked for a, a male um, periodontist, he could rebuild and graft bone into that site because there were walls to the bony defect, if this makes any sense. You can kind of almost see what it would be like these, this other um, 
density of bone is like a different wall compared to this more radiopaque line here. We're kind of seeing a 3D structure in a 2D um, form, so that's why we can see these different shades of gray. And so anyway, so these these walls basically could support this uh, bone and it could graft a bone and, and, and get some new bone. But if it was horizontal bone loss, there were no walls, it was just flat and it just dropped like an elevator down. Um, there was nothing to build the bone, you know, kind of in, no matrix or walls. So um, it does, it makes a difference when we're thinking about um, periodontal surgeries. Okay, here's an example of localized versus generalized. You can see if it's just, you know, this is real easy. Everywhere in the mouth is healthy. They just have a, some localized area around a couple molars and the premolar um, is affected. Um, and But everywhere else, the bone levels are totally normal, although that to me looks like maybe there might be some here and here, but it just might be the way they draw this schematic. Um, and then down in this picture, you can see that pretty much everywhere there is some bone loss. So generalized, more than 30% of surfaces, localized, less than 30% of um, surfaces. Oh, and there's a little, um, oh, I'm going to go back here because there's a note over here that says one, one way you can do it is you can do math. So you can say, okay, there's four teeth, um, there's four teeth, and here they have 32 teeth in their mouth. They have all their teeth. So four divided by 32 is 12. So that's 12%. 12 12% 12 is less than 30%. So then you'd call it localized. So you can kind of, if you're a math person that really needs that math to kind of make it clear or understandable, then you, and you could do that with six, you could do it with five, you could do it with 12 teeth, and you just divide it by 32 or however many teeth they have, and that'll give you, um, uh, percentage and if it's below 30 you're localized if it's above 30 you're generalized okay periodontal disease continued we're going to talk about severity so um, this is some uh, pictures to kind of go along to help um, get into the details a little bit more of the staging so stage one what we used to call slight coronal third 15% um, of bone loss or less it would look something like this. It's not going to look severe at all. Um, there's going to be other things that are going to go along with that when you do your clinical assessments, like four millimeter pockets, some bleeding, things like that, um, that will kind of help you make your um, clinical decision. Stage two, what we used to call moderate coronal third, 15 to 33% bone loss. It's going to look something more like this. It's still not dramatic. Um, it's a fair amount of bone loss, but it's, it's not dramatic. Um, and then stage three to four, what we used to call severe, extending beyond the middle third of the tooth. It's going to look something more like that. It almost looks more like halfway down the root sort of is almost where it looks like. And there's frication involvement, which is what kicks that up for sure into the stage three and four. Okay, so healthy, I think this, we've said this in earlier slides, but healthy, we need a well-defined alveolar crest with um, within two millimeters of the CEJ. Stage one periodont um, periodontitis, rounding of the alveolar crest, loss of the lamina dura. So we start to get these. We may still have some lamina dura, but it's not going to be um, maybe as prominent. And we're going to start to get a little bit more of like a, a, a rounding and then the sort of a widening of the PDL at the top. Um, stage one periodontis, you might start to also see eroding of the alveolar crest, and then it's going to start to drop more than two millimeters from the CEJ. So you're going to go into that 15% um, of bone loss. Um, it's got to stay under that 15%, but you're going to start to see that sort of moth-eaten eaten appearance of the bone. Um, it's going to start to drop down below the CEJ. Stage two, it's going to be between um, 15 and 33 percent of the bone loss. Cal is clinical attachment loss. So when we talk about, and you guys will learn, um, I don't know that if you, you've probably 
been introduced to the term by now, I would think. But um, when we look at clinical attachment loss, we're looking at what we can visibly see with our eyeballs uh, as far as recession. So we measure that, like when we look in somebody's mouth, from the CEJ to the top of the gingiva, what's that number? And then we're going to take that number and we're going to add it to um, the periodontal pocket, which would be how far below um, how far below the um, gingiva that the probe went. So their actual clinic, um, their actual cal, um, maybe you may have two millimeters of recession and then a four millimeter pocket. That means that their actual um, cal is 6 because you're going to add those two numbers together. So if they have 3 to 4 millimeters of cal, then they are in a stage 2. And then we also are going to pair that with our radiographic bone loss between 15 and 30 percent. So again, there's going to be more things that you use in your tool bag when you're actually um, trying to determine this besides just looking at radiographs. Um, stage 3 and 4 is going to be severe to advanced bone loss, vertical bony defects extending to the middle third of the root and beyond. Um, cal will be um, at or above 5 millimeters. And then um, this is just basically saying the same thing. This might have just meant to say three in that stage four. There are, when we it, when you guys learn, you'll learn about this in great, great detail in Katie's class. And so she's going to give you a um, breakdown into these great sheets that talk about other criteria. So there's more things. So there are things that divide stage three and stage four. But when we look at a radiograph, we don't have to quite go into all that detail yet. Um, we kind of can j just generalize it to the radiographic bone loss. But when you're actually working in clinic, there's um, more aspects that you add to it. We just don't need to go into it right now. Okay, so here are some examples of um, some radiographic bone loss. Here there's just a ton of calculus um, right through here. That's what all of this kind of radiopaque area is. But then here you can see some vertical bone loss here. You can see some, um, this is probably, this is like slight vertical. Some people might still call that horizontal. Um, but uh, you can see that it's much more um, vertical right here. It's more obvious there. And then this is what it probably looks like in their mouth for real. Um, so like a actual clinical presentation. All of this calculus that you can see here on the radiograph, that's what that looks like. So you can see that it's fairly... Um, the x-rays go through the calculus pretty well, like the, oops, sorry. This looks like a lot of calculus, but when you see it in real life, it's like, holy moly, that's a ton of calculus. So calculus always is bigger in, in life than it looks on the radiograph, just like decay. Decay does the exact same thing. So frication involvement is loss of bone in the frication region, which is um, in the area in between the roots. Um, when somebody has uh, frication, the, the risk of them losing that tooth um, goes up significantly. And the reason for that is because you, you know, you floss your teeth with floss or you use these interproximal um, little brushes and all these different things that we give people and they can slide them in between their teeth and they find that fairly difficult you know most people can do it if they practice and you know but we classically know that people complain about flossing and and we have to harp on it and get people to use all these different tools to try and convince them to clean these hard to reach spaces well Add, you know, take a space that's down below the gum and in between two roots that is virtually inex inaccessible to a patient. Now, um, when I was working in a perio office, I would have patients use water picks. I would have patients use little toothpicks. I would give them little tools that and show them where the frication is and say, you know, this is the technique and I would watch them do it and then I would try and refine it and help them to clean out those areas. 
because that's the only option they really have is to do their absolute best because the overall prognosis of a tooth with a furcation is fairly low. Now, if the recession has dropped down and exposed the furcation, if they're willing to get in there and clean it with a proxy brush, they can actually do a pretty good job. But um, that, you know, all depends on the patient's motivation and desire to keep um, an area healthy. Um, and some more things that add to the complexity are the widened um, periodontal ligament space, and this often signifies mobility. So you can see these really widened spaces through here. So these teeth are probably, you can probably wiggle them even with your fingers and see some movement, at very least with the two ends, of, two blunted ends of instruments, but that usually indicates some kind of mobility. Okay, so, um, Furcation involvement again here, and then cervical caries. You can see some cervical caries through here. Once we have this much recession and bone loss, this whole area is susceptible to cav uh, cavities, and it's a very small area, and it's not that far to the root. So p if there's a decay in this area, it's a really short distance to get to the nerve of the tooth. So root canals and um, abscesses, the likelihood of that um, increases quite a bit. So here is um, an example of generalized um, stage three horizontal bone loss, although I have to say I'm kind of actually second guessing this slide and wanting to say that it almost looks more like a stage four, frankly, because that's there's so much bone loss um, through here. Uh, but you can see up here, this yellow line, this is where the CEJ is. So the bone used to be, you know, roughly right in here, and it's just, you know, really dropped. But this is significant right through this frication. There's the other little yellow line. So that much, roughly that much bone has been lost. So here's just some visuals to kind of start to think about, you know, you can, you can actually, you know, print, print out pictures and draw on them till you get kind of used to, to kind of guesstimating or estimating, because that's sort of what we do when we look at radiographs and we, we estimate the amount of radiographic bone loss. It's sort of just a very educated guess, really, just as the best we can do. And this actually is a pretty poor, <laughs> this isn't a very good line. But here's a really good example of how two CEJs are not exactly straight across from each other. So the CEJs are a little bit at an angle. So this alveolar bone, when it was healthy, it probably, you know, had a little bit of an angle to it. But that doesn't matter anymore because the bone dropped way down to here. But you can see how this is about the length of the root here and here. And we almost have, I mean, there's almost 50% of the, of the bone is gone. It's probably a little bit less than 50% or a little bit more than 50%, but, you know, maybe, you know, maybe 45, um, 45% or 40% of the bone has been lost. So it's a significant amount of bone, but you can kind of help yourself and draw out the length of the root and the amount of bone loss before you get used to saying, oh, 15%, 15 to 33, or greater than 33. That's definitely greater than 33, though. So if you were to describe this bone loss, how would you describe it? This is an interesting area because if you notice this molar, where's the CEJ on this molar? The CEJ is down here and this molar has tipped into this space. This is probably the wisdom, well it's definitely the wisdom tooth and it's tipped into the second molar space. Um, so it's not, it's not really bone loss here. Um, Although if they were to straighten it up, it probably would actually end up with some bone loss, but then they might be able to graft it. Um, but this is an area where it, it's kind of affecting the periodontium, but because um, of the, where the tooth is placed. But if you look at these other areas, you like you look through here and you look through here, and you look through here. How, how much bone do you think has been lost for this person? Do you think it's less than 15% or somewhere between 15 to 33%? 
if you said um, more than 15%, that's where I'm at too. I'm thinking they're closer to a stage two um, with horizontal bone loss. So most all of this, even though that looks a little vertical, if you look at again, their CEJs are not, not lined up. So this is actually considered horizontal bone loss. The same with this, the CG, CEJ is here and here. So this, even though that looks a little angled, it's actually horizontal bone loss. So I would put these this person at um, at about a, a early stage two. So what about this? How would you describe this bone loss? So we have the CEJ here and here. We have the bone way down here. That looks to me to be somewhere in the range of maybe 45% or so of the bone has been lost. So if you said um, stage three, or four, it's kind of hard to say just from the x-ray, but stage three or four horizontal bone loss, then I agree. And what about this one? So here we can see some really good lamina dura, lamina dura all through here, pretty smooth, even PDL, about I'd say, you know, two millimeters from the CEJ. Might be more than two millimeters from the CEJ there, but I think that's just their, their normal. Here's the CEJ. There's the CEJ here. And this, this is an interesting space. The bone is way up high and it almost looks like the periodontal ligament is widening there, but again, this could just be occlusal forces. It could be their no normal. It could not have any anything to do specifically with um, a periodontal disease process. But overall, I would call this person um, healthy and would say no bone loss. But if they had some bleeding like right through here, then you might say to yourself, you may be in the, the early, early, earliest stages and, you know, so who knows, but that's why you need, that's why in the beginning you said you can't tell just from radiographs the whole story. The, the whole picture is not painted. You, you need your clinical assessments. But if I was to just look at this, I would say healthy, no bone loss. So what about this one? This is a very blurry picture, so it's kind of hard to say. But we got the CEJs here, here and here. We have the bone level here, here here. It almost looks like the PDL um, space uh, is starting to widen right through this frication, so that makes me wonder if there's not some beginning stages of frication involvement. I would probably say that this this is a stage three, um, especially like right through here. I would lean more to a stage three than a, than a moderate for, two, for sure.